Did you know? Halloween edition. There are more than 150 dead hikers on Mount Everest, many of which are used as landmarks. Famously amongst them is Green Boots, who has been laid to rest near the summit since 1996. All climbers who reach the dead zone of Mount Everest have either passed by or taken a break by Green Boots ever since. Well, until the body was recently evacuated from the mountain. Welcome to the Lore of the South. Lore of the South. Welcome back to Lore of the South with me, Kelly Cruz. How the heck are y'all doing? Well, we have reached the peak of spooky season. It's Halloween, y'all. Make sure to share some pictures of your costumes and your decorations with us on social media. I'd love to see them. What's been going on around here? Well, not too terribly much, which I guess is a good thing. Producer Mike is moving into his busiest time of the year. It's stuffing season which means we'll be making lots of extra deliveries to all of the stores and i've started back to work after being off for most of the summer back on the route y'all that means no more sleeping in or late nights binging my current addiction the americans which i highly recommend if y'all have not seen it yet like it, it had me hooked after the first episode and, and that's rare normally i give something three episodes before i'm hooked and this one had me at the first not sure what's on my to watch list next what else have i done a lot of, a lot of tv watching <laughs> um i watched all of season three of dairy girls in one day um i guess you could call that an accomplishment do y'all watch the series i think anyone who grew up in the 90s no matter where will relate to the dairy girls it is hilarious but you may need to turn the captions on for those thick northern ireland accents with this being our Halloween episode, instead of history making news, I've gotten permission from our friend of the podcast, Dr. Chris Essing, to read his children's book, Dubious Jack, the Pumpkin King, to you all. Dubious Jack, the Pumpkin King, sprang to life when Halloween, born from fire and witch's brew, as a gust of wind caused the cauldron to spew. The ember sparked and the fire spat, until the flames reached the mantle where the pumpkin sat. As its flesh began to sizzle and its vines slowly burned, the seeds inside the pumpkin jumped and churned. And in one moment of magical delight, the pumpkin's vines sprang like legs as it jumped in fright. It flew in the air and down on the ground, then danced and wiggled and jiggled around. The pumpkin's commotion made such a terrible sound that Effie the witch came running down. Wiping the sleep away from her eyes, Effie stared in amazement and at her pumpkin's surprise. The vines had caused a horrendous wreck as the tentacle smashed while Jack stumbled and leapt. In shock and awe and anger and fright, Effie grabbed up her wand and gave the pumpkin sight. A burst of light filled the room, and as the dust settled, Effie grabbed her broom. With wonder and amazement, the pumpkin settled down, then looked in awe at the new world he had found. Effie swept away. As the pumpkin stared, she huffed and puffed, but the pumpkin just glared. So she gave him ears so that he could hear her moans and cries and cackles and jeers. But the pumpkin just sat in fearful glee as he watched the witch on her cleaning spree. She straightened and tidied, then sang and cheered as she realized that Halloween was finally here. Effie scooped the pumpkin into her hands and sculpted him a nose from graveyard sand. She placed it there between his eyes, then kissed the flesh to his surprise. And where her lips had gently sat, a mouth had grown all plump and wet. As he opened his mouth to finally speak, his words came out all mumbled and meek. So the witch cut open a lid and placed a brain inside. 
and sprinkled on him some courage and pride. Then out of her arms, Jack leapt to the ground, where he swaggered and swayed and pranced all around. The pumpkin danced a jig all across the floor, then led Effie into the night and out the door. As he looked up in amazement at the stars in the sky, he reached out to touch them, but he could not fly. Effie seized up her broom so that Jack could see, not simply the stars, but the moon and the trees. Placing him there on the straw of her broom, Jack wrapped his vines around her and away they did zoom. Up towards the moon, then down with a bound, Jack giggled and laughed and made such a sound. Oh, what a sight, he could hardly believe, for what Effie showed him seemed impossible to conceive. They flew across rooftops, touching the eaves, then down under the canopy of falling leaves. Reds and yellows swirled all around, and oh, the sweet taste of dewdrops as they fell to the ground. Then up again they went, Jack could smell the fresh air. His eyes opened wide, it was more than he could bear. He let out a squill of wonderful glee, and it filled Effie's heart with a joyous harmony. Jack felt like the king on such an amazing night, as his journey showed him so many incredible sights. He watched costume children as they ran from door to door, grabbing handfuls of candy and heading out for more. He saw ghosts and goblins of every shape and size, then more witches and pumpkins to his surprise. They look like you, they look like me, Jack whispered and pointed so Effie could see. The witch nodded her head and raised her hat with a smile, then looked back at Jack and said, This is our night to howl. For it's only on Halloween that you can be a pumpkin king and I can be a queen. On each and every other day we must disappear, as I am but a simple witch all throughout the year. But for one amazing and magical turn around the sun, extraordinary things can happen, so we come out to have some fun. Revealed from the shadows, we step into the day, and there no one notices us, as we all have come to play. The rich and the humble stand side by side, next to skeleton and goblin who do not have to hide. So let us enjoy this night before it disappears, as I have much to show you, and we must spread some cheer. Then in a sudden flash, they soared far out of sight, dancing and laughing in pure delight. With much fanciful and amazing reverie, Effie gave Jack the world to see. While smells of candy tickled his lungs, sweet cola slid down the back of his tongue. With all that he ate, Jack swelled in size, shaking the broom to Effie's surprise. It swirled out of control and the pumpkin began to fall. She swooped down to save him, but there was little hope at all. She raced her broom down as fast as she could go, but as Jack disappeared into the clouds, her heart was filled with woe. She dove into the night, but her dear friend she could not see, so she spent final twilight hoping for a glimpse of he. But as the evening drew to a close, and all had come to pass, she found that Jack's vines had all been tattered and his body completely smashed. A lump appeared in Effie's throat and tears welled up in Effie's eyes as she discovered the news of her friend's untimely demise. As dawn was rising in the east, Effie gasped beneath her breath. She then scrambled to Jack's body to undo his horrendous death. She threw back her head and looked into the sky, and there she found her courage as twilight's magic passed into her eye. She pulled some of the seeds from Jack's chest and scattered them in the sand. She cast a spell upon the earth and all across the land. Everywhere the seed shall sprout and their leaves shall taste the air. Jack will return to walk the earth and I will meet him there. So, on each and every Halloween, in gardens near and far, Effie is said to walk the earth, searching beneath the stars. And in the path where Jack's new body lay, Effie dances all around. She picks up the pumpkin, gives him sight and sound. Holding him for but a moment and feeling such glee, 
Effie takes Jack by the hand on a magical fantasy. And if you should happen upon them on one unsuspecting Halloween, just wave your hand in the air as this is not a dream. Although they will disappear before your very eyes and you may believe that this is all a bunch of tricks and lies. Just listen to the sounds of their laughter piercing the sky as they shout out Happy Halloween to all the passers-by. And that was the story of Dubious Jack, the Pumpkin King by Dr. Chris Essing. And thanks, Doc, for letting me share your Halloween adventure here on the podcast. Do y'all ever wonder about the origins of stories like where did they come from? What's the story behind the story kind of thing? So, befitting the spookiest day of the year, the day that the dead rise up and walk the earth again, let's dive into episode 53, Horrid History of Fairy Tales. And where should we start? From the beginning, of course. Fairy tales and nursery rhymes are some of our oldest forms of entertainment. Fairy tales usually are tales of morality, a story that teaches the listener a valuable lesson. Nursery rhymes are a way to convey current events without stating the obvious and possibly finding your head on a chopping block. One of the very first volumes of fairy tales was put together in the 17th century by Parisian Charles Perrault titled Tales and Stories from the Past with Morals, subtitled Tales of Mother Goose. Y'all, I had no idea that Mother Goose was a dude. And then nearly 200 years later, we have the Grimm brothers from Germany, who traveled throughout the countryside speaking to both peasants and nobles alike, gathering their stories for their volumes called Children and Other Household Tales. Many of the Grimm stories were very similar to those of Perot's, though believe it or not, the Germans toned the stories down a bit to make them more palatable for children. Well, in some cases they did, in others they bloodied them up a bit more. And now that you know a bit of the history behind the first books of fairy tales, let's get into them. Fairy Tales and Nursery Rhymes, the story behind those beloved stories and verses. First up, we've got Cinderella. Most of us know the Disney version or the Drew Barrymore Ever After movie. Well, in the original Cinderella, Cinderella forgives her ugly stepsisters and marries them off to men in faraway lands. In the revamped version, when the prince comes to call in hopes of finding the lady whose slipper he found, he meets with the wicked stepmother and stepsisters. The stepmother whispers into her daughter's ear to cut her toes off, for when she's queen, she'll never need to walk again. So the stepsister does that, and the slipper slides onto her foot. The prince is exalted. He pulls the first stepsister up onto horseback and the royal party rides away. Not too far down the path, two pigeons fly near the prince and recommend that he should look behind him to his would-be bride's feet, where he can see a pool of blood in her glass shoe and a trail on the ground behind them. He returns the now toeless fraud to her mother and the second stepsister has cut her heels off so that her none too delicate feet can fit into the slippers. The prince is excited once more and begins his trek back to the castle with his would-be bride. But lo and behold, the pigeons reappear with the same warning about the second sister. She too is a charlatan and has slippers full of blood. Once again, the prince returns to the home of Cinderella and this time, he gets to meet with a love who had vanished from the ball at midnight. And y'all, I hope they at least rinsed out those slippers before passing them on to Cinderella to try. But you know, her dainty feet slid right into the glass slippers, no hacking or cutting needed. 
She and the prince lived happily ever after, and the pigeons returned to peck the stepsister's eyes out. So, not only for their lies and altogether awful personalities, they were hobbled and blinded. So, y'all try to keep the lies and fraud to a minimum unless you want to be attacked by talking pigeons. Next, we have The Real Beauty and the Beast. Though the fairy tale was written by Viennu in 1740, the true tale is even older and from the 1500s. Pedro Gonzalez was born in the Spanish-owned Canary Islands sometime in the 1530s, it's thought. He was born covered in hair, a condition known as hypertrichosis. He was severely abused as a child, kept in a cage, fed raw meat and animal feed. Until one day in 1547, he was gifted to King Henry II of France. Instead of treating Pedro like an animal, Henry undertook a great experiment, as he called it, and set about educating young Pedro. He was dressed in court finery, given good and fully cooked human meals, taught courtly manners, and was well educated by French tutors. Pedro could speak and write in three languages, and in spite of his nickname of Wild Man, he rose in status in the court. But not in everyone's eyes. In 1559, King Henry was killed in a jousting accident when he took a splinter from a shattering lance to the eye. The ownership, yeah y'all, the ownership of Pedro was passed to Henry's queen, Catherine de Medici, sometimes called the Serpent Queen. And a little side note here, have y'all watched that series on stars? She was something else, y'all. I've read a couple of biographies about her, and um, she was a dark character. Catherine has been portrayed a tad on the evil side for over a hundred years, and after reading this, I tend to believe it. Catherine thought it would be a great experiment of her own to marry the beast of the French court to a beauty and see what would happen. Queen Catherine arranged the marriage between Pedro and the royal court servant's daughter, also named Catherine. And y'all, I'm having a lot of sides in here, but I think there were only like three names in the 1500s for royal women. We got Catherine, Elizabeth, and Mary. Those were the names. That was it. Those are all you had to choose from, it seems like. The pair met on their wedding day, and by royal standards, it was a successful marriage. And from what I've read, it was also quite possibly a happy one, too. The couple had seven children, four of which were born with the same genetic condition as their father. To the delight of Queen Catherine, she felt that it was all owing to her that she created this wild family. Pedro and his four children with hypertrichosis were shown and exploited all across Europe. The three kids without the genetic condition were left alone to be raised normally. The family eventually settles in Parma, Italy, where the affected children were given away as gifts or pets to different royal families. The last mention of Pedro was in 617, and it's believed he passed in 1618, near the time of the christening of one of his grandchildren. His wife, Catherine, died a few years later in 1623. The couple had been married for more than 40 years, and that is the origin story of Beauty and the Beast. Kind of sad, but I do hope that Catherine and Pedro were able to find some happiness together. All the while, Pedro and half their kids were exploited and seen as a symbol of greatness to have them as one's possession. Up next, we've got Sleeping Beauty, or Briar Rose. Y'all, this one is dark, and it contains rape, so listener beware. There are two ancient versions of the story, one from the 14th century and the other from the early 17th. Sleeping Beauty was named Talia, 
and was the daughter of a king who owned vast estates throughout France. As a teen, Talia was set about spinning flax into thread. Well, a sliver of flax pierced her finger, leaving a splinter. She soon fell unconscious. Her father feared she was dead, but couldn't bear to put her in the ground. So he left her in the castle. He had all the servants load up all the goods, and they abandoned Talia in a tower. A bit of time goes by, and another king, who happened to already be married, is out hunting when he finds this seemingly abandoned castle. So he sets about exploring, and who does he find high in one of the towers? The unconscious form of the lovely Talia. He is overcome and can't stop himself. Besides, who would ever know, right? So he does what he did, which should have ended in jail time, and goes on about his way. Well, around nine months or so passes, and the unconscious Talia gives birth to twins. One of the babies manages to get one of its mother's fingers into its mouth and sucks the splinter out. Talia regains consciousness only to find that she is suddenly the mother of two babies and has no clue what in the world has happened. Then somehow, the wife of the baby's daddy finds out about them and sends her cook after the twins. The wife wants them cooked up and served to the queen, a la Greek god style. Well, the cook couldn't do it, so he confesses this to the king. The king then murders the queen in a rage and sets out to rescue Talia and the twins, and they live happily ever after. And y'all, I'm thinking Talia could have really used those three fairy godmothers that Disney added in. Now how about a couple of nursery rhymes for y'all? These always seem so sweet and innocent until we start looking into them. These rhymes were a way to deal with current events from long ago without using the names of the people that were involved, and maybe that would keep your head on your shoulders. The most commonly known is probably Ring Around the Rosie. The children would recite the verse while joining hands and moving in a circle. In case you didn't know, Ring Around the Rosie is the first telltale sign of the Black Death. Ye old bubonic plague. The death rate was so high, and the stench from all of the dead and dying was next to unbearable, so people took to carrying around a posy or a bouquet to hold under their noses to not only ward off the smell, but hopefully the plague as well. We all fall down. In other words, we all die. Pretty morbid for a children's rhyme. Ring around the rosy, a pocket full of posies Ashes, ashes, we all fall down And how about Mary, Mary, quite contrary, how does your garden grow? With silver bells and cockle shells and pretty maids all in a row this one I always assumed was just about a lady's garden. Nope, it was all about Bloody Mary Tudor. Mary, once queen, set about trying to restore England to the Catholic Church. Well, the garden in the verse actually pertains to a graveyard to where all of her victims would be planted. Silver bells and cockle shells refer to torture devices used to pry confessions out of accused Protestants. The pretty maids all in a row. Well, those are the Protestant martyrs that were lined up and burned at the stake. Mary, Mary, quite contrary. How does your garden grow? With silver bells and cockle shells and pretty maids all in a row. And how about one more? Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. Jack fell down and broke his crown, and Jill came tumbling after. Well, 
this one. I mean, it, it seems pretty obvious, right? It was about two kids that were sent to get their mother some water. But it's actually speculated that it might instead be an allegory for the French Revolution. Jack being King Louis, he fell, broke, and lost his crown. And then Jill, Marie Antoinette, came tumbling after. So in other words, they and the crown both fell. Side notes. Y'all probably heard about my one-star review I got on Apple Podcasts. Apparently, I make up all my content and change the stories to suit myself. Oh, and I'm shameful, y'all. Even though in each and every set of show notes, I post my citation list. I always use at least three sources. And y'all, anytime I change anything up, I say so as a disclaimer. And really, the only time I can think of doing so was in The Tale of the Two Trees of Athens. And all I did there was turn a historical marker into a story. Heck, I even went so far as to tell, according to the dates of the story, one of the main characters would have already been dead. But y'all, I digress. And I'll get off my soapbox. Thank you to everyone who loves the show and has left us those five-star reviews. Producer Mike and I really appreciate the support. If you ever want to get in touch, you can email the show at laurathesouth at gmail.com. Make sure to follow us on social media. We've got an Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and TikTok. Consider subscribing to our Patreon for exclusive content. I'll post a link in the show notes for that. And now... How can we call this a Halloween episode if I don't leave y'all with a ghost story? How about suggested topic from Jessica Griffin, the Stovall Mill Covered Bridge in Helen, Georgia. The covered bridge was first built in the late 1800s to help service the nearby mills. The first structure was washed away in a major flood that occurred in the 1890s. The second bridge was constructed in its place in 1895 and still stands today, though the road that once went through there was diverted long ago. During the Great Flood, not only was the original bridge lost, but also the local mills that lined the creek, a grist mill, a sawmill, and a shingle mill. It's thought that many lives were washed away in those floodwaters as well. And today, if you go to the bridge at night, you might hear the clomping of horses coming through the covered bridge. You might hear the cries of the flood victims, or the voices of those who didn't know that they had died in the rushing waters. There's sounds of crying babies and wailing women. Would you dare to venture down to the Stovall Mill Bridge after dark? I think next time I'm in Helen, Georgia, I might have to go. Happy Halloween, y'all, and we'll talk to y'all later on Laura the South.